to you, Matt. Cool. All right, everyone breathe. We're, <laughs> past, we're, we're past some of the crazy encryption stuff. All right, so this is, this is a little bit lighter, uh, lighter research. It's still really, really cool. This one I think is my favorite on the list this year. So for those of you who, who didn't get to watch this Black Hat talk by Paul Stone, I very, very highly recommend going and watch the Black Hat talk. I'm not going to even slightly do it justice. It was probably one of my favorite Black Hat talks that I saw. Uh, but I'm going to really try my best to, to, to give him as much credit as, as due here. So number three is the pixel perfect timing attack with some HTML5. Um, so just a little bit of history on the first part of this attack. So browser history sniffing. Uh, it, it's been around for a while. Uh, a few different techniques were around. Uh, some simple ones using timing. Uh, you could time it using JavaScript. Here's just a little bit of code, right? You, you can make an image uh, with a date stamp. Uh, the, the image tag doesn't actually go to an image. It goes to some website that you want to tell if the person had been to or not. <clears throat> um, it, you, know, you, can, you could watch if they're logged in or logged out. The, the timing difference would be way different for that image tag. Uh, so this is nothing new. This was this is a while ago. It's not really reliable over the internet, um, but but this exists. Then there was CSS. Uh, this was talked talked about back in I don't know four or five years ago, uh, and and most of the browsers fixed it in 2010. Uh, but yeah, you could just ask the CSS if a link that's on the page is blue or purple. If it's purple, they went there. This is browser history sniffing at its finest. Really really quick. Uh, there was some research done that showed that uh, somewhere in the couple hundreds, close to a thousand different ad networks and adult sites were actually using this in the wild on their users to, to you know, target advertisements. So what's old is new again, right? So uh, Paul actually brought back uh, browser history sniffing, and this is really cool. So uh, using a, a function in, in the browser called request animation frame, this function fires before every frame is loaded onto the screen of the browser. Okay, so every time the, the, a frame is repainted on the screen, this function fires. So how does this come in handy, right? So here's the attack scenario. So a page loads. So I, I had no idea this is how browsers work. This is really cool that he figured this out. So the page loads. Uh, step two up at the top. The JavaScript, you know, you can use your JavaScript to insert a link onto a page. So say that's Google.com. The browser fires an asynchronous query to look up the history in the history database of the browser whether or not that link has been visited. The asynchronous part is really important there because for performance reasons, the website isn't going to wait all day until it figures out if you had been to this website or not. It's just going to go ahead and, and move along loading the website and, and just working as it's supposed to, right? Um, so th that's where you have this one number four. The browser paints the link as unvisited and blue. Then a few frames go by. This is in, in terms of milliseconds here, right? And uh, we're going to uh, see the, the DB query come back, right? The DB query is completed. It comes back. The URL is, uh, if the URL is visited, a second browser repaint gets kicked off and changes that link from, from blue to purple. So he did a live demo on stage of this, and he slowed down just a Google search engine result page, and it showed uh, all the links actually stay blue for a few frames, and then it turned purple. So it's a really a uh, key point here. But even then, it's still a matter of milliseconds difference from those repaintings. So what Paul did is figured out how to slow down this repainting using a bunch of old GeoCities techniques, right? Like, I want to make my link look cooler, <laughs> All right? So I'm going to add some shadow to it. I'm going to change the color. I'm going to, uh, you know, make it bold. Whatever you could do to actually, with CSS, slow down the, the link repainting. So this actually increases the time difference between repaints. Okay. So how does this work in the attack? So he's going to load a frame, right? Load an iframe. This could be completely invisible, but in his demo, of course, it's not. With a bunch of URLs, a ton of links, just to one URL. I'm sorry. So a bunch of links, all pointing to the same URL, say Google.com. Then using the request animation frame function that fires before each frame loads, uh, he's going to register, uh, you know, which what time each of these things are going to load. And then if it, only one repaint happens, that means the link stayed blue. If two repaints happen, the link is purple and it, it's visited. 
So here's just a quick screenshot of his demo site that he pulled up. Right, so that, that on the left, all those, uh, those hash signs uh, are, are his demo links, right? So say it's 50 anchor tags, right? Uh, and he can uh, affect the padding to slow it down uh, or speed it up or whatever he's doing here. And then on the right are all the URLs that he's checking to see if the user visited. And then a green check mark is uh, what he proved is visited or not. And so you can see he was 100% accurate here, right? So then what, what I want you to focus on here are the, the numbers to the right of those URLs. So you can see down the first column, they're all pretty much in the 70s, a few in the 90s, but they're all, that's milliseconds, frame times in milliseconds, right? So the first initial paint job takes somewhere in the 70 millisecond range, 70 to 80 millisecond range. The second frame is universally zero, no repaint happened, okay? And then the third frame is where the magic comes in. For the purple ones, there, there is a repaint that occurs, and that repaint is close to 70 or 50. It's a slow repaint. And the ones that are not <coughs> visited, it's, it's a fast repaint. So just telling the difference of a slow repaint and a fast repaint is how he can sniff this. So this is really cool. Brings, brings a technique that was fixed back in 2010 uh, back to life with, uh, with just a little creativity. So the second part of this attack, this is really cool. He can actually read a frame pixel by pixel. So you're not supposed to be able to read the contents of an iframe for very obvious reasons, right? An attacker can force you to go to his site. He iframes some site of yours that he wants to steal data out of. Uh, that that, that uh, you're not allowed to read inside that iframe and steal information out of it, right? <clears throat> but with this technique, you actually are able to. So this is where the HTML5 trickiness comes in. So enter the SVG graphics type functionality of HTML5. So a bunch of these graphic techniques have filters on them. The one that we're going to focus on is the epimorphology filter. It can either uh, dilate or erode an image, make it thicker or thinner, right? So turns out that this, this uh, filter could either be relatively slow as it has to go pixel by pixel and, and decide whether or not to make it uh, across the whole image and decide whether or not it's uh, dilating or eroding it. But there is actually optimized code in certain situations to make it go way quicker that it only needs to go down the left-hand side of the picture and not, all, not through every pixel of the entire image. Uh, one of the situations that this optimized code can be used in is when the image is entirely a flat color, like an entirely black image or entirely white image, right? Uh, if it's a noisy image, if it's not a flat color, uh, it needs to be, uh, it, it needs to use the slower code. So there's a big timing difference here. So then there's another uh, HTML5 tag that we're going to look at, which is the FE composite using the operator multiply. So you can actually multiply two images together and you get a result. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, if you take an all black image and multiply it by a, a noisy image, a stock noisy image that you have, uh, you're actually going to get an all-black image. But if you take an all-white image and multiply it by that noise, you're gonna actually going to get noise. So using this result, you're going to see a difference. Uh, you know, using, looking at these results is going to be a difference between black and white pixels. But when in the real world is anything ever black and white, right? So what if we're going to have to make it black and white? So here's the real-world scenario that, that Paul demoed. So he, he's going to make an iframe on a page. He's going to take a snapshot in time of that iframe because it could change and you don't want to be trying to read it pixel by pixel while it's changing. You're going to apply an SVG threshold filter. Okay, what that does is choose every pixel and make it either black or a white pixel and then take all of those and multiply them by a noise image and look at the result. So I'm actually going to play a video here just to do it some justice. So this is a, a picture of an iframe. I think it was the iframe of a Google uh, comment box, and his name was somewhere in that, and so he wanted to read his name out of the iframe from the host site. So let's see if we can play this video here. Going pixel by pixel, and it's grabbing whether or not it was black or white and it's actually being able to print out a new resulting image as his name from the Google uh, comment box as Paul Stone. So this is really, really cool stuff. 
left thing that you saw changing, it was hard to see in the video, but it was either that that result did have a difference between black and noise uh, in that bottom left thing. So this results in an image, and that's pretty cool. But uh, as you saw, it was kind of slow, and, and it is resulting in an image. You still need to get that image back to, uh, to the host somewhere, and some human needs to look at it and read it. What would be better if we can get text back? Right? So you just send, if you read text out of a frame and could send that back to an attacker, that would be faster and uh, it would be automatable and digestible by a computer. But the problem is we need a chunk of text where we actually know the font and we know, you know, it's got to be a predictable piece of text. Well, it just so happens that source code is standardized through all the browsers and using uh, the view source, you, you could actually uh, view the source of a web page remotely, right? So you could do this iframe source equals view source colon HTTP and the web page, and that would actually frame the source code of that page. Oh, what kind of stuff can we take out of the source code of a frame? Well, CSRF tokens being one, we talked about that earlier, being private. Uh, just other private information, um, which we'll see in a little, uh, little bit. Um, but how does this work? Okay, so you, you're going to take, this is how we set up the attack. You're going to take that whole font, the whole character set of the font that you're trying to perform this attack on. And what he did here was overlay all of the characters uh, of that character set on top of each other and then create a heat map. And then the orange pixels that you see on the screen here of this heat map are pixels that are used in exactly half of the character set. So for this example, we're using the, uh, the hex characters 0 through F. And, uh, <clears throat> the orange pixels are used by exactly half, and you can see the binary tree go down here to, to break it down. So what this does is actually optimize the code so that you don't need to read every pixel of that font to tell which character it is. You only need to read certain pixels to reliably tell, okay, by looking at these four pixels or five pixels, I know that this is a zero or a one or a two or a three. So with hexadecimal characters, you just need four pixels. If you read four pixels, you're going to be able to tell uh, which character it is. For all alphanumeric, you're going to need five pixels. And for uh, the full, uh, full character set with special characters, you're going to need six pixels. This is still very much optimized over the few hundred pixels that you would need to read for an entire thing. So again, I have a quick video demo uh, to try to do it some justice here. Uh, so again, this is that same Google comment box, but he's going to try to specifically read some pieces of information out of the source code uh, and resulting in text. So I'm going to hit play here and try to narrate. So he clicks start. It's going to go calibrate to the font, and then he, it finds the Google ID location in the source code, and then starts to read the, the Google ID number, uh, number by number. And you can see this is way, way faster and results in text. He gets his telephone number. For some reason, that's in your Google comment frame, mobile number, uh, and all sorts of stuff. So he could frame anything that he wanted in here that didn't have X frame options uh, enabled and, and start using, pulling out all sorts of information. Uh, so, yeah, that's that one.